Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. She was obviously new to the Lutheran Church. That fact became apparent in the question she asked the pastor while the two of them were discussing church membership. With the naivete of one who was no doubt unaware of how things actually work in the church, she said, now pastor, what exactly are the expectations of being a member of this church? Dumbfounded by the question, the pastor replied, uh, I'm not sure I know what you mean. Without hesitation, she said, well, if I become a member of this church, what will be expected of me? For instance, how often am I required to attend worship services? How much am I expected to contribute of my time and money? Regaining his composure, the pastor replied, oh, Oh, please let me explain. Membership in the church is different than that of membership, say, in a club. Here in the Christian church, it's, it's really more of a relational thing rather than that of a numerical thing. Dear friends in Christ, you know the pastor made an excellent theological point there. You see, membership in the Lord's church is based first and foremost upon a relationship, a relationship which God himself has established with us through the giving of his son as our savior from sin. It's a relationship that is based, well, on grace, and not on works, not on how often we attend worship services or how much money we may put into the offering plate or how many hours we may volunteer here around church. Yes, the pastor was right. It's a relational thing. It's, it's not a numerical thing. But you know, that new member, even though she had, I suppose, turned things around somewhat, the fact is she was not as far off base as we might think. Because you see, the relationship that God has established with us is intended to bring about a result in our lives, a response, if you will, Yes, our relationship with God is intended, as we heard here in this gospel reading, to bring about fruit, or we might say good works in our lives. In order to teach us that very important truth, our Lord Jesus used the imagery of a vine. He said, as we heard there in the gospel reading, I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me bears much fruit. Apart from me, he went on to say, you can do nothing. Like so many of the pictures that Jesus uses to help us to understand these spiritual truths, well, this picture of him being the vine and we being the branches, it's a very helpful picture in our understanding of what life as a child of God is supposed to look like. So let's take a closer look at this illustration which our Lord gives us, and let's start by considering the branches. Now, as anyone who has ever worked around a grapevine knows, branches are not intended to be mere ornaments, are they? No, a grapevine is among the most productive of plants. It, it spreads its branches out far and wide, and each branch is intended to bring forth grapes, bring forth fruit. No grape 
uh, vine grower would be so foolish as to invest his time and his effort in cultivating vines merely for the greenery on its branches. No, he looks for results. He looks for grapes. He expects that there will be fruit there. And if there is none, why, he will cut the branch off. Dear friends, what is true in the world of horticulture, you might say, well, is even more true in the kingdom of God to which you and I belong. As branches of him who is the vine, well, we are not mere ornaments who have been placed here on this earth so that we might appear to be spiritually alive. No, we are spiritually alive in Christ, and we are therefore expected to actually produce. As reflected in our congregational mission statement, we're not just to connect to the Lord through an activity like this of worship. We're not just to grow in the faith that God has given us through the study of his holy word, but we are also to share, share his love with others. That is, we are to produce fruit, the fruit of good works that glorify God and serve our neighbor. I mean, think about it. Richly and daily we receive the forgiveness of our sins so that we can do what? Go on sinning all the more? Do whatever the sinful nature desires? Is that how this relationship we have with God is supposed to work? No. Daily and richly we receive the forgiveness of our sins from a gracious and loving God so that we, as Martin Luther says in his explanation of the second article of the creed, so that we may live under him and his kingdom and serve and obey him. In other words, so that we can bear fruit. Now the apostle Paul, he spells out some of the fruit which our gracious Lord looks for in his disciples. In Galatians chapter 5, Paul writes there, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. What an array of abundant fruit, that is. Friends, if you think about it, there is hardly a, a, virtual, a virtue conceivable that does not come under one of those categories that Paul just listed there for us. Pages upon pages could be written to describe the, the powerful and the far-reaching effects of each of those various fruits as they are lived out in the life of the Christian. But here, my friends, is the critical question. Are they being lived out in you? Are they being lived out in me? Is that fruit evident in our lives? Do our lives, for instance, truly reflect love? The love that God would have us display? Are we joyful people? Or are we always finding the negative in just about everything around us? Do we seek peace? Or do we sow seeds of discord? Ah, and how about patience? Huh? How about patience? Do we extend the same amount of patience toward others as we expect to receive from God? Say, speaking of patience, personally, I think I've, I've grown a bit in that area in my life. About 20 years ago, you may recall, I shared a story up here from the pulpit about a time when I was home with my son Andy, who at that time was five years old. And noticing that things were unusually quiet around the house, I decided I'd better go see and find out what he might be up to. 
So going out into our garage, I, I noticed that this big puddle of water was there on the floor with his bicycle in the middle of it. Andy, I sternly said, what on earth are you doing? I'm washing my bike, he proudly replied. Some of you might remember that story. Well, since I knew that there was no spigot in our garage for water, I asked him, well, where did you get the water to do that? Scarcely did a word come out of my mouth when I noticed that scattered over the floor, there were empty containers of bottled water that I had recently purchased from the store. And back then, mind you, bottled water was sort of a luxury. It was fairly costly. Yeah, he used bottled water to wash my bike. Can you believe it? Boy, was I mad. But as I said, that was nearly 20 years ago. And I've grown a bit since then. You see, now that I have grandchildren, well, that kind of stuff, it really doesn't bother me as much as it used to. No, when grandkids do stuff like that, I, I think it's sort of cute. <laughs> Furthermore, I can always send them back home with their parents. But all kidding aside, let's face it, regardless of the circumstances, yeah, it can be tough to be patient with others, just as it can be tough to show forth in our lives the fruit of kindness and goodness and faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So friends, what are we to do about that? With our inability to be the kind of fruit producers that we should be, that God has called us to be and expects for us to be, are we therefore destined to be cut off from God like a barren branch is cut off from the vine? and then thrown into the fire, the, the fire of hell? Well, you know, the good news that Jesus gives us today in this gospel reading is that we are capable of producing the abundant fruit that God desires of us. We really are. But friends, in order for that to happen, it is absolutely essential that we remain attached to the vine. That is, to him, Jesus, who alone is able to supply us with all that is necessary to be fruitful and productive disciples. Remaining attached to Jesus to him who is the source that provides the power and energy we need to produce the abundant fruit which God desires of us. Sort of reminds me of a story uh, told about a native from a very remote mountain village who had the opportunity to visit a large modern city for the first time in his life. As he walked through the city, he was exposed to all sorts of fancy gadgets, you know, and sophisticated technology. He found himself completely engrossed by what he saw and wished he could have those kinds of things for himself and for his uh, little shanty that was back up there in the mountains. He could not, however, take much back home with him since he only had a limited amount of money. So in trying to decide what to take back, he decided that the thing that amazed him the most there in the city was all the electric lights. So with his limited resources, he purchased for himself a sack full of light bulbs and light sockets and light switches. And then arriving back at his village, he got busy hanging the lights both outside as well as throughout the inside of his humble abode. As he went about his work, all the people there of the village watched him with great curiosity and asked him, hey, what are you doing? But instead of uh, trying to explain it, he just smiled and said, just wait till it gets dark. Then you'll see. Well, finally, nighttime came, and with much excitement and eager anticipation, the man turned on the switch that he had mounted there on the wall, but nothing happened. He looked 
bewildered while all his fellow villagers were laughing at him. You see, what the man did not realize is that light bulbs and light sockets and light switches are useless unless they are connected to a source of power. Jesus, my friends, is our source of power. Sometimes, you know, we forget that fact, don't we? Yes, sometimes we're like that man in the story, finding ourselves longing for certain things in this life. It may be a good marriage we long for or a happy, healthy home environment for our children. It may even be an active faith life, none of which are bad things for us to desire, certainly. The trouble occurs, however, when we forget that the power to truly experience and achieve those things in a God-pleasing, fruitful manner comes only through a connection with Jesus. So often, that is the part that we forget. That is the part that is left out. As we surround ourselves with all the, all the appearances of a good life, we'll exhaust all of our resources in trying to make things appear to be good and wonderful. But in the end, we're frustrated when it doesn't work out that way. In the end, it's like hanging light fixtures that are not hooked up to the electricity. I mean, they may look good and promising at first, but then when the darkness of sin begins to settle in, they are unable to produce because they are not properly connected. Today, my friends, your risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ holds out to you a power supply. Today, Jesus once again assures you of his unlimited love and forgiveness toward you. That assurance is not only found in his word that is proclaimed to you here, but it is also given to you in the sacrament of your baptism as well as in Holy Communion, which we are about to receive here shortly. As you connect to him, you will grow in your faith, and that will in turn enable you to share. That is to produce fruit. Going back to that new member I was mentioning there at the opening, the question is not, what must I do? No. Now that Christ is in you by his Spirit, now that you have the assurance of his great love and forgiveness in your life, friends, the question now becomes, what will I do? For in the words of the Apostle Paul, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard our hearts and our minds in Christ, our risen Savior, who is the true vine. Amen.